Let's analyze and take up the homework from the past few nights. For the past three days, we've been working on course pack page 11. The first night, we drew a position time graph. Although the graph paper was provided for you, ideally the graph should have been drawn on a full sheet of paper. The problem with a small graph is that it has a lower precision and certainty, as you can't see the details very well. This also results in a greater procedural error when you're drawing tangents on the graph. The minimum size of a graph should be at least half a sheet of paper, but try to use an entire page. Choose a scale that allows the data to fill at least 70% of the grid. Also, use clean scale increments, such as 1, 5, 10, 50, or 100. Weird increments like 3 or 7 make it very difficult to read the data off the graph. The next day, we drew five tangents and calculated their slopes. The first slope, measured at the beginning of the graph, probably had the highest procedural error as the data points were squished close together and made it hard to determine the slope in this region. Meanwhile, the last slope drawn on the far right was much easier to determine. I hope you weren't shy about drawing the slope lines nice and long. In fact, the longer the line, the better the certainty. Long lines force you to subtract very big numbers with very small numbers, increasing the number of significant digits in your final answer. After measuring the slopes of the tangents, we then transferred the instantaneous velocity values onto the next table and plotted the corresponding velocity time graph. Since we had multiple data points, we could reduce our procedural error by averaging our data. The data points appear to form a straight line, so that's why we drew a line of best fit. Any outliers due to earlier measurement errors would have been averaged out. On a velocity time graph, this linear correlation indicates a uniform acceleration. So we can use the acceleration formula to determine the boulder's acceleration. As mentioned earlier, when measuring a slope, you'll want to use two points on the line that are far apart from each other. If you choose points that are too close to each other, you may end up with a difference that's only one significant digit. This is the worst case of uncertainty, as your errors can be as much as 100% off. Pause the video and pick two points off your line of best fit, and sub your values into the acceleration formula, and unpause this video after you've calculated your acceleration. Ready to see my attempt? Depending on how carefully you plotted your graphs and drew your slopes, your answer might be much different than mine. In my attempt, my acceleration value worked out to 0.19 meters per second squared. This is a bit off from the correct answer, but more on that later. Let's continue with our analysis on course pack page 12. Calculate the first 20 seconds of surface area underneath the VT graph. This area is in the shape of a triangle, so we'll use the formula 1 half height times base to determine its surface area. Just keep in mind that the height is not measured in meters, but in meters per second. So 1 half times 4 meters per second times 20 seconds equals 40 meters downhill. Did you just see what happened to the units? There's a difference between surface area and area underneath a graph. When you measure surface area, like this box, you're measuring centimeters by centimeters. That's why the surface area is measured in centimeters squared. But when you're measuring the area underneath a velocity time graph, the dimensions are in meters per second by seconds. Mathematically, this area works out to meters, which is a unit of displacement. Didn't I say that units always work out? So this proves that the area underneath the velocity time graph tells you the displacement of an object. Question number two asks us to determine the surface area between 20 and 50 seconds. This appears to be in the shape of a trapezoid. You can use the trapezoid surface area formula if you've memorized it, but let's try solving this using first principles. A trapezoid is one part triangle and one part rectangle. We'll solve the triangle's surface area first. The surface area of a triangle is one half height times base. Be careful though, the height of this triangle is not 10 meters. Instead, it's 10 meters per second minus four meters per second, which is six meters per second. So 1 half times 6 meters per second times 30 seconds equals 90 meters. Downhill. The surface area of a rectangle is height times base. This time around, the height of the rectangle is 4 meters per second minus 0 meters per second. 
and 4 meters per second times 30 seconds equals 120 meters downhill. When we add the area of the triangle with the area of the rectangle, we get a grand total of 210 meters. But when you look at the original data table, there is no 210. That's because the area underneath the VT graph does not tell you the position of the object. It only tells you its displacement. You'll have to subtract the positions at the 20 and 50 second mark to get to 210 meters. What would happen if you added the displacements from part 1 and part 2? Well, 40 meters plus 210 meters would equal 250 meters. Since you started at position 0, that's why the position at 50 seconds is equal to the total displacement at 50 seconds. Realistically, only a perfectly round boulder rolling down a perfectly straight incline calibrated at 1.168 degrees below the horizon would attain such clean numbers. I, on the other hand, used an algorithm to calculate these numbers. So these tables of values were created under the strict condition that acceleration must be at 0.20 meters per second squared. The purpose of your homework from the past few nights was just to see how accurate and precise you were with regards to drawing graphs, tangents, and calculating slopes. And there was a lot of room for procedural error along the way. So let's determine how far off you were from the right answer. The formula for determining percentage deviation is as follows. For my efforts of determining acceleration, I had a value of 0.19 meters per second squared. What was yours? Leave your answers in the comments section below. We're going to compare it to the theoretical value of 0.20 meters per second squared. When you sub the values into the formula, you might notice two vertical bars in the formula. This is to find the absolute value of 0.19 minus 0.20. In other words, if the answer is negative, make it positive. In my efforts, I ended up with a percentage deviation of 5%. Not bad. With enough practice, you can achieve a deviation of 2% or less. So how can you improve on this? Well, you can improve your instrumental uncertainty by using a larger sheet of graph paper with denser grid lines. When you draw your tangents, make sure your lines are nice and long. That way there's a greater certainty in your measurements. You can improve your curves procedurally by using a thinner pencil lead. Try drawing the curve upside down as your hand naturally arcs this way. And most important of all, practice. Aim for a percentage deviation that's 2% or less. This device is called a ticker timer. It's a noisy machine that makes dots on a piece of paper. One end of the paper is attached to a moving object, and as the object moves, the dots spread out. Let's go through some examples. The first example shows an object that is moving at a constant velocity. See how evenly the dots are spread out? as the paper is being pulled to the right. Keep in mind that the ticker timer is stationary on the table, and it's just the paper that moves. What's happening with the second ticker tape? Good, the object is accelerating. At first the dots are close together, but as the object moves faster to the right, the dots spread further apart. What about the third ticker tape? At first the dots are far apart, meaning that the object was moving very quickly. But as time went by, the dots got closer and closer, meaning that the object was decelerating. In summary, the ticker tape apparatus is a machine that captures changes in motion by placing marks at consistent time intervals on a strip of paper. The machine operates at 60 Hz. This means that it's making 60 dots every second. Frequency can be calculated by dividing the number of events by the total time of the experiment. However, we're more interested in the period of the machine, which is how long does it take for it to make a dot. This can be determined by dividing the total time of the experiment by the number of events. You might notice that the period and frequency are reciprocals of each other. Let's make sure that you are familiar with these terms. Pause the video and determine the period or frequency of the following. Ready for the answers? If you're wondering how many digits to show for your final answer, take a look at the number of significant digits in the question. When you measure the position of the object on a ticker tape, 
make sure that you measure the dots relative to the starting dot. It helps to draw a vertical line through the first dot and measure all adjacent dots relative to the first dot. Also, call the first dot dot number zero. After all, this is the dot at zero seconds. For homework tonight, take a look at course pack page 14. Let's pretend that we have an ideal ticker timer that resonates at 10 Hz. If the frequency is at 10 Hz, then the period is at 1 over 10 Hz, or at 1 tenth of a second. So the dots are separated by a tenth of a second. The start dot is at the bottom of the page. Measure from the bottom and create a table of values for the position of each dot. With this data, create a position time graph draw three tangents, and transfer your calculations onto a velocity time graph. Draw a line of best fit on the velocity time graph and measure its slope. Compare your calculated slope with a theoretical value of 1.2 meters per second squared and see if you can achieve a winning percentage deviation score of 10% or less. Also in preparation for your lab, check out the How to Use a Ticker Timer video made by one of my former students. And for more fun adventures like this, make sure that you prepare yourself for your first quiz, which is next class. All the best.